morning. All right. I'm excited to be joining you this morning in week 10 of our study on the Gospel of Mark. Just two more weeks left after next week, and I just want to put in a quick reminder, if you weren't listening during the announcements, which I understand happens, okay? If you weren't listening during the announcements, there's no 10.30 service next week, so just be aware of that. We only have our 9 o'clock service next week. I want to start this morning with a couple of stories. First, a short one that's kind of silly, and then uh, a more important story in the next one. Did you ever get detention as a kid? I don't know why, but I just look right at the middle school principal when I say that. Did you ever get detention as a kid? I know the idea of detention has changed a little bit over time, but it's basically the same as it's always been, right? Even if it looks a little different, the idea is the same. It's time out for big kids when they do something that's bad, but not bad enough to suspend them or expel them, right? I could probably count on one hand the detentions that I got between middle school and high school, and two of them were actually intentional, but those are stories for another time. So the, de- the first detention, though, that I ever got was partially because of a word or a concept that's going to play a role in today's scripture. See, I was in class uh, with a friend of mine, probably sixth or seventh grade, I don't remember exactly, and we were being sneaky, and we were playing a game against each other on our phones, like underneath the desk, and looking back, I have no doubt that the teacher knew what we were doing and just did not care, and so we thought we were being sneaky, and we're playing a game together during English class under our desks, And he made a move in this game that really should not have worked at all. Like it was something silly and dumb, and it shouldn't have worked, but it did work, and he beat me. And I was so mad that his stupid move in the game worked and that he beat me that I said to him from a couple rows over, you are an oxymoron. (laughs) Now if you don't know, an oxymoron is a phrase that includes two terms that contradict each other. It's actually an English term. Things like jumbo shrimp, right? Things that contradict each other. Jumbo shrimp, true lies, virtual reality, original copy, funny pastor, right? Oxymorons. (laughs) And I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that I had heard it before, and so I just used it as if the oxy part didn't mean anything. Like, I was trying to call him a moron, but I didn't want to just say moron. I wanted some more oomph, you know, and so I said oxymoron. But that's not what that word means. And so the teacher, of course, heard me yell at my friend that he was an oxymoron, and she pulled me out into the hallway, and I kid you not, this is what she said. She looked at me and she said, I would have just given you a warning for calling him a mean name. But because you use the word oxymoron so incorrectly, you are coming into detention to do a worksheet on English vocab. (laughs) And I'm not kidding, she made me come in and do a worksheet on all kinds of words and their definitions, including oxymoron. They're things that don't seem to quite go together, or at the very least, they don't feel like they should go together, right? And we come to this scene in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus teaches something that might seem to us and certainly seem to his followers at the time to be some kind of oxymoron when in fact it's the most important truth that you'll ever hear. And so if you're a sermon title person, today's is Surrendering to Salvation. Right? The idea that in order to achieve true freedom, we actually have to give up and surrender everything about who we are. So in another story, this one is imaginative in nature, there's this man, he lives in Perea, which is a town along the eastern side of the Jordan River between Bethlehem in the north and Jerusalem in the south. He's a young man, still has that youthful glow about him, but he's old enough to hold a position of authority or respect on one of the region's high councils, right? Like he's a county board of supervisor, or he's a city councilman, or something of that nature. And despite his young age, he commands respect among the other leaders. He's independently wealthy, probably rolls up to the town hall meetings on the horse or camel equivalent of a Rolls Royce, right? On top of that, 
he observes all of the laws that had been given in the Torah, right? The first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish law. He followed all of the rules. And so if you met him, if you had the chance to encounter him, you would have said that he was a good guy, right? You would have said that he was an honorable man, like the kind of man that you want your daughter to bring home, right? But despite external appearances, despite seeming like everything in his life was going exactly the way it should be, all was not right with this man. In fact, he was deeply worried. He was concerned, like stayed up at night, couldn't fall asleep, concerned about the state of his soul. He believed in eternal life as was taught in the Word of God, but he was so afraid that he wouldn't be able to achieve it. And so one day, he hears of a teacher coming to town, an influential teacher, so influential, in fact, that there were rumors about a number of different miraculous things that this teacher had supposedly done. And so surely this man that was coming to his area was a man of God. And so this young, wealthy, authoritative ruler rushes out to the edge of town to meet the new rabbi. See, like us, all areas of his life seem to be categorized by working and building and doing in order to achieve for ourselves the lives that we want to have. Like winning the game of life and doing what's necessary in order to get ahead. And yet, no matter how hard we work, there's still something missing. No matter the authority, no matter the youthfulness, no matter the wealth that this man had, there was still something missing. And when we take that same pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality and apply it to our faith like this man, we find ourselves in a pit of desperation and fear and worry. And so the message from Jesus today is to all of you and me who call ourselves followers of Jesus to be reminded of something that we talk about all the time, but we live like we've forgotten. And it's also for those of you who are searching this morning to find the truth. Can I borrow that? This is a rookie mistake right here, a preacher who forgot to bring the Bible. Goodness gracious. All right, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. Don't put that on my performance review. Yeah, a preacher thought that's an oxymoron right there. Thank you, Amy. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony and shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a young boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This morning, I want us to be reminded that surrender is necessary for salvation because only God is good and because he alone is perfect, because his standard is perfect. Now, men in the Middle East, during that time, during the time uh, that Jesus lived, they did not run, right? It was considered beneath them. It was considered undignified for them to do. You may have heard that when you talk about Luke chapter 15 and the story of the prodigal son, when the father runs out to meet the son. That was something that men in the Middle East did not do. It was considered uh, not respectable. It was considered lowly or beneath them. And they certainly did not fall to their knees before anyone who was not worthy of great respect. But our rich young ruler, as we see in Mark chapter 10, we know that he's rich and we know that he's young from these uh, parallel accounts of the same story in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. And so this rich young ruler has now run through the dusty streets of Perea and found himself kneeled before Jesus because he just has to know. Because he's so desperate, he just has to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And Jesus' response seems kind of weird, right? Of course you're good, Jesus. Why would Jesus say, why do you call me good? Only God alone is good. And we look at that and we're like, yeah, only God's good and you're him, right? Sure, you're fully God and you're fully man, but you still fit Jesus within the parameters of what we call good. But Jesus knows that the rich young ruler doesn't know that. He only knows Jesus to be a man, to be some kind of a prophet or a teacher, but to be fully human. And so Jesus is not saying that he's not God. He understands that this man, this rich young ruler, only knows him to be a human teacher. And so therefore he knows that this man thinks that people can be good. The young ruler probably thinks the same thing of himself, right, on a regular basis. Like, gee, I'm a pretty good guy. And he thinks the same thing of Jesus. And Jesus' response is kind of like, no, 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 only God is good. Now, if we're saying that only God is good, then that must mean that we're not talking about like high V brand, it's pretty good, but it's not the best, Right? If we're using the word good to describe God himself, if only God is good, then we're not talking about pretty good, we're not talking about very good, we're not even talking about really good. We're talking about perfect. And that shouldn't be a surprise to any of us, right? The Bible says that no one is good. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. And then 13 verses later in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Don't believe me? Let's just use the same test that Jesus used on the rich young ruler. Have you ever held hatred toward anyone in your heart? Jesus' standard is that if you've hated someone in your heart, it's equivalent to murder. Have you ever looked at anyone lustfully? That's spiritual adultery. Have you ever stolen something or lied or gained something dishonestly or disrespected your parents? How many times do you have to tell a lie in order to be a liar? One time. How many cars does somebody have to steal in order to be arrested for theft? One time. Now, you might say that that's harsh, but I think you and I, we actually like perfect standards. We just don't like them when they're applied to ourselves. I promise you do, because when someone that you love is going in for surgery, do you want the doctor who's had just one or two little hand slips with the scalpel recently, or do you want the one who has gone their whole career without a malpractice lawsuit? We like perfect standards. We just don't like them when they're applied to ourselves. And so Jesus runs this man through six of the Ten Commandments, the external ones that are more easily measured, and the man says, check, 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 check. I'm good on all of those things, Jesus. I'm feeling great about myself this morning, right? I'm good on those things. And he's probably not entirely wrong. Because in the ancient understanding of the Mosaic Law during that time, as long as you externally observed the commandments and then you made the proper restitution when you broke a commandment, then you could honestly say that you kept the law. Like you broke the law, but you did the thing you had to do in order to make yourself ritually clean, so now you can say that you haven't broken the law. But Jesus here is after more than just some checking of the boxes. He's after this man's heart. He's after this man's entire life. And so on the surface, it would appear that Jesus is telling this man that he could achieve eternal life by his actions. He gives him a command full of action words, right? He says, go and sell and give and follow. But Jesus, with love in his heart, it says in verse 21, he goes after the one part of that rich young ruler's life that he just can't give up. Jesus isn't saying, do more good stuff with your money and you'll be saved. He's not saying, give more to charity and then you'll be saved. He's making the exact request of the man that shows that in his heart, he's actually broken the first two commandments. That you shall not have any other gods and that you shall not make for yourself an idol. See, the rich young ruler has turned for himself money into the idol, right? The God of his life. He says, I have done everything, Jesus. 
I'm a good guy. I check all of the boxes. I'm a rich young ruler. I, I serve on the city council. I do all of these things. I've kept all of the commandments. I've given you my everything, and I've given my whole life over to God. And Jesus says, by asking this question, except one thing. That one area of my life that I just really don't want to give up to you, God, because I like the way things are, and I like my life how it is, and just I have all of these other things, Jesus, that I've given to you, but I just want to keep my time, or I just want to keep my money, or I just want to keep my extramarital affair. Like, all of these things you can have, but I just want to keep this thing back here. And in our sin, we have replaced the Creator with the created things, and we find ourselves with Jesus staring us in the eyes with love in His heart and an outstretched hand saying, come to me. And yet we walk away sad because we can't give up that one pleasure. That one comfort, that one way of thinking, that one sin. Jesus is holding to us an outstretched hand. And we walk away with our faces to the ground, sad. See, God doesn't just want some of you. He wants all of you. And to the ears of the world, it does sound like an oxymoron, but only when you completely surrender your entire life to God will you truly experience the fullness of life that God has to offer. Only when you give everything up can you get everything that you need. And so Jesus continues on. He begins talking to his disciples in verse 23. He says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. The second point, the last point this morning, surrender is necessary for salvation because only God can save. See, the rich young ruler has gone, and so Jesus shifts his attention to his disciples and makes a statement that leaves them completely shocked. One of the popular thoughts of the day among the Jews was that those who were wealthy were the people that God had most blessed. And so if someone was rich, then surely they were going to have eternal life because it was clear that God was on their side because they were rich. And we kind of act like that too, don't we? Like whoever drives the nicest car and has the best behaved kids in the church is going to sit closest to Jesus in heaven at the table, right? But Jesus says that some of those people that on the outside look the most favored they're actually the ones that are the closest to missing out on eternal life because their faith is in their riches and not in Him. And for those people who look to things other than Jesus to save, to fulfill, to be the author and perfecter of their lives, Jesus says it's impossible for them to enter the kingdom of God. If your brain works like mine and you thought, that sounds very silly, a camel going through the eye of a needle, like what is Jesus trying to say here? The Arabian camel was the largest native animal to Palestine, and full-grown male adult camels would weigh between 900 and 1,400 pounds and were on average 10 feet long and six and a half feet tall. Now, Linda, you might have to check me on this, but the biggest diameter for the eye of a needle that I could find online was just over two millimeters. It's completely and utterly impossible, Jesus says. For you and me to enter into the kingdom of God, into the rule and reign of God that he has invited us to even now and lasts for eternity. That began at creation and will culminate at the day when Christ returns and heaven and earth become one and we rejoice in his presence forever. It is impossible for you and I to get there on our own. There's just no getting there by trying to have it all together because it's simply impossible for us. We tell ourselves, I, I've done enough and I pat myself on the back and we go back to caring about our stuff more than we care about Jesus. Or on the flip side, we live, we live as Christians like, you know what, I was saved by grace, but now I've worked myself into this pit of depression and sin and despair. And so Jesus, he saved me back then by 
through, by grace through faith, but now that I've been saved, I should know better, and so I need to get it all together myself. And so we work ourselves into this understanding of God that says, I need to have it all together before I can go to Jesus. And can I say to you this morning, that's just simply not true. That Jesus looked into the eyes of a man that he knew would turn his back on him 10 seconds later, and he loved him, it says in verse 21. Or, or on the flip side, we make an idol out of our stuff, our ability to keep it all together. We, we make an idol out of Jesus. I gave my life over to you. I surrendered everything to you when I was saved 5, 10, 25, 35 years ago. But now that I've given my whole life to you back then, I can have my little things over here now. Like, Jesus, I'll give you my entire life, but I just won't give you this one thing. Salvation is not something that we can get by being good enough, and it's not something that can be found in the riches or the comfort the world has to offer. There is no hiding back parts of your life and expecting that to be for you what only Jesus can be. The only solution for that need that you feel in your heart to fill our lives up with achievement and wealth and success comes through surrendering everything. There is no solution outside of God, outside of giving absolutely all of it over to God. Salvation comes only through the grace of God and there's nothing you can do to earn it or deserve it. He's not just asking for some of you, He's asking for all of you. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works so that none can boast. I've always been somebody who likes to have control. And maybe even more than that, I have this fear of people viewing me as incompetent. And so no matter what I'm doing in life, it's very difficult for me to give up on anything because deep down in my core, I have this belief that I have to be able to handle it. And I've been that way for as long as I can remember. And When I was about 14 years old, my family just kind of started to fall apart, right? Many of you have heard various parts of this story before, but my my brother was being bullied and that led to him being angry and taking out his anger on our family and he'd fight with us and he'd run away from home and my dad had almost died a couple of times within a six month period from COPD and it was like our family was just kind of crumbling to the ground from the inside out. And the last time my brother ever ran away, I remember I was about 15 years old. It was really late at night. I was in the living room, and I was holding my father on my shoulder as he sobbed. And I had only ever seen him cry once before in my entire life. And I held him on my shoulder as he sobbed, and through his tears asked me, what did I do wrong? How do you handle that? I don't care if you're 15 or 55. What do you say to that? And just a few short weeks later, by the providence of God, I was sitting in a hot, smelly gym and I heard the gospel preached. And it, it wasn't the cool music or the engaging sermon that got me out of my seat to run forward to the front of the gym and throw my entire life at the feet of Christ. It was the Holy Spirit whispering in my ear, you can't do this on your own, but you don't have to. All of the things that keep me and you from being good, the things that separate us from God, that trick us into thinking that we need to cling to the things, the comforts, the securities that this life has to offer, whether it be money or self-reliance for salvation, they were hung to the cross with the nails that went through the hands and feet of Christ. And what really breaks my heart is that the rich young ruler went away And sure, he was sad for a little while, right? But life probably went back to normal for him. And he believed that he'd made the right choice by clinging to his money. He thought, man, that Jesus guy said some great things. I almost did it. But he just asked me to give up the one part of my life I couldn't get up. But I am so happy that I get to be rich and young. And he lived his life thinking he'd made the right choice until the day he died. 
and he went to hell and he realized that choosing himself and his money over surrendering to the salvation of Christ was actually the worst decision he ever made. It seemed like the right decision at the time, but it was actually the worst decision he ever made. Brothers and sisters, all the money and the comfort and the success in the whole world will mean nothing when you stand before our God and judge. And he is a just judge, and we should all rightly stand before him condemned. But there's another way. There's another way. A a, a way that was made when the Savior of the universe had the flesh torn off his back. When he walked through a city carrying that piece of wood. When he carried that cross to Calvary. And when he died to satisfy the wrath of God on your behalf. He made another way. A better way. And there is simply nothing that you can do to earn or deserve it but surrender your life to him to accept the free gift of salvation that only that little baby that we're here to celebrate can offer. If you're stuck thinking that you need to be good enough or that you need to get more stuff or find more success or look forward to the future and it'll finally satisfy that longing deep in your heart, my plea for you today is simply to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Surrender everything to Jesus, and I promise you it is not an oxymoron that when you give everything to Him, you will be the richest you've ever been. And for those of you who are in Christ but have heard this message and realized that you've got an area of your life that you're just holding on to, right? Hiding away and making for yourself an idol. Understand even now, when you're feeling guilty, when you're feeling shame, when you're feeling condemned, that God does not regret saving you. He doesn't regret it. There's nothing that you did that you walked in here with this morning that you were hiding from Him that made Him regret saving you. He looks upon you even now, even in your confusion, even in your sin and idolatry, He looks in your eyes with love. And an open hand, beckoning you back into the life that you could only dream of before you met him. For all of these things, they're an oxymoron. They're impossible with man. And yet with God, nothing is impossible. Would you pray with me? As we begin our prayer this morning, I'm going to invite forward our communion servers to come up here to the front. Lord God, heavenly King and Judge, we submit our lives to you this morning, trusting, understanding that it is only by grace that we have been saved. And so God, I pray that whatever it is that's hindering us, whatever it is that's hanging in the deep parts of our hearts that we're hiding away from you, God, I pray that we would surrender all of it to you this morning, that we would come to you as the one who looks upon us, not with judgment or condemnation, but with love. Lord Jesus, we pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.